Uh, my name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Sunday, February 2nd, 2014, and I'm interviewing Anita Caldwell Jackson for the Oklahoma Native Artists Interview Project, sponsored by the Oklahoma Oral Research History Program at Oklahoma State University. We're at the Tulsa Indian Arts Festival, where Anita has just won first place in painting this weekend. Anita, you live in McAllister, Oklahoma. You were a teacher in the Kiowa Public Schools for many years and you are now retired doing art full time. You work in acrylics, watercolor with pencil, even before you began doing sculpture, I remember seeing three-dimensional effects in your paintings, uh, mixed media works. You are well known at the Trail of Tears art show, the Five Tribes Museum in Red Earth, where you've won a number of major awards. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. You're welcome. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I've lived in southeastern Oklahoma my entire life. I actually live within a 20 mile radius of McAllister my entire life. I lived in a little town called Beach, which is east of McAllister. I was actually born in McAllister, and presently I live on the same street where I was born. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I lived in Kiowa for most of my life in 1960 and then I moved to McAllister. I actually lived in McAllister for the first time in 2001. What did your folks do for a living? My dad worked at the ammunition plant. He was a timekeeper there. My mom uh, stayed home for the most part. She had a, after the kids got a little bit older and teenagers, she, she worked in one of the sewing factories there in McAllister. She did different things with sewing. Uh, any brothers or sisters? I had uh, two brothers. Uh, one is still living, and um, there were two older brothers. So. How about your grandparents on either side? My uh, grandfather, my native uh, heritage comes through my uh, grandpa Caldwell, and uh, I didn't really get to talk to him much. He was uh, alcoholic. And so he wasn't around, never lived with my grandmother the whole time I knew him, but so I never really got to talk to him. And at the, you know, at the time I was growing up, I, I didn't even know to talk to him. And then my um, other, my mother's folks, I, I, knew, I knew all the other grandparents and everything, but the one that my native heritage came through, I didn't really get to know too well. And he died when I was 13. Mm. What was your first memory of seeing Native art? Well, my first memory of seeing Native art. I, I have a degree in art, and when I went through um, college, you know, I, I wasn't influenced by Native American art. The, the Native American art shows, it's kind of worked in reverse because it's taught me about my Native culture. I didn't learn it through family, like I said, because I, I never really got to talk to the relative. And, you know, my parents grew up during the Depression, so people were just worried about, you know, getting by. And um, art was just something that you didn't, you know, do. But I remember when I was, I was doing a, sh a local show there in McAllister for years, and I was doing Native American people, and uh, someone asked, asked me, why don't I do a, a Native American show? I didn't even know they had them. And so, you know, I got to ask it around. That's how I found out about the uh, Trail of Tears show and the Fasilas tribes. And that's where I started doing the Native American show. So probably, my first influence with Native American art would have been at those shows. Although, you know, at art shows, you do see a little here, a little there. But I was actually doing some. Of, of Native art, yep. but yeah. What is your first memory of making art? Oh. We uh, grew up where, you know, you didn't have a lot of toys. You didn't have all the games. So people my age, probably a lot of people did the same thing. So we had to make a lot of our own things. My mother used to entertain me by drawing paper dolls, and she taught me how to trace and make clothes. So I designed their clothes, 
And I remember one day she was just too busy to draw my paper doll for me, but I had watched her draw it. So I, I drew that face and I, I can almost still remember what it looked like. And from that point, when I did finally go to school, I went to Bage School and they had first, second, third, and fourth in one room with one teacher and then the fifth to the eighth in one room with one teacher. And that was the entire school. There was two teachers. So we had a lot of downtime while the teacher was working with the fourth graders. <laughs> anyway, I wound up drawing pictures of girls, I always drew faces, for the older kids, the fourth graders. And that gave me that, that uh, encouragement, you know. And I, it felt good, so I wanted to do it. And I would make mud pies, but my mud pies would be faces. And, and when I, one of my jobs was to uh, rake the yard after my brothers mowed the yard. I would rake it, the grass up, and I would rake it into little piles of pictures so that if an airplane flew over, <laughs> you know, they'd see a, a pretty picture. So I, at a young age, I mean, I was always doing something like that. But I think my mother's influence, you know, making toys, just something to entertain us. We, we did our own entertainment, and I believe that's why. That's a great story about that. <laughs> The airplanes? <laughs> yes, <laughs> they'll see the art from the air. <laughs> um, so you sort of described your art experiences in basically elementary school, I guess. Um, any, any art classes that you had in secondary school or high school? When I moved to Kiowa in 1960, I was in the fourth grade, in the uh, ninth grade, uh, we had a, a gentleman, Clark Run was his name, and he was actually a mentor to Reba McIntyre because Reba went to school at, at Kyle. <laughs> and so he was musically inclined, but he was also artistic. They started an art program when I was in ninth grade, and we had to draw a picture to get into the program back then. And uh, so I, I started with the art program there at Kyle School in the ninth grade. When I graduated, I came back, I taught art there. When I retired, they stopped the art program. So I was there at the beginning and at the end of that art program. They did start a music and drama program, so they still stayed with the arts, but they, the visual arts, as far as I know, they don't have a visual art teacher anymore, but that's, it started in the freshman year. That's pretty unusual for that day. Um, so you decided to attend college. Can you kind of walk us through how you chose. Okay. Growing up in a small school, we had no counselors. And I actually became a counselor <laughs> too, so while I was teaching a, art, I was academic counselor, counselor or I, uh, in, just in high school counselor. Mm -hmm. And but since I had no guidance, my parents uh, gave me a choice. I could have a car or they'd pay for my college. So I decided I would I would take the college and you know, just take what you want to take. Well, I always loved art, so um, I'm going to major in art. That was a, I don't know what I was going to do with it. And minor in PE, because I like to play basketball. <laughs> so when I, I went to junior college, and, and I started with those two majors. And then when I transferred from a junior college to Southeastern and Durant for the four-year college, I enrolled late, and I, I, couldn't get all the classes I wanted and I got into mechanical drawing because it was drawing and I thought well this may help me and I really loved the mechanical drawing so I have a minor in drafting and I actually worked as a technical illustrator for a couple years before I became a teacher. When I graduated college I did not want to be a teacher because I didn't want to be a, a teacher at the time and then after I worked for two years I got married and my old high school art teacher, Clark Run, he told me if I would go back and get my certificate, they were going to have a position open. So I went back and got my teaching certificate, and then went on and got my master's in counseling, but that's how I wound up being an art teacher. So aside from um, mechanical drawing, did you feel like you got a good base in college? For art? Mm -hmm. You know, I would have done art with, with or without the college. I, there were some things... I, I didn't want to do necessarily, you know, what they were doing, but I did learn things despite myself. <laughs> I just wanted to paint what I wanted to paint, and sometimes you have to do what they want you to do. But in doing that, I can see where it, it helped. Now, 
Could I have done it without it? As far as the the art, yeah. I, you know, you can you can take a a class or not. I've not had very many art classes other than what I had in college. I took one workshop with Troy Anderson, and I only got to take half of it. Was it an acrylic workshop or? It was uh, yes, it was acrylic painting, and um, I could only stay. It was going to be two weekends. I could stay for one weekend, and then I think I had one other little course with another artist. And that's other than the college. The rest is self-taught, basically. And how old were you when you took the workshop? I was I was in my twenties, late twenties, probably. And in college, you're still doing some native subject matter when you when you get a chance on your own or in college mm -hmm. no in college i hadn't i hadn't gotten to that point yet so you wouldn't be able to there you didn't really have a style of any kind that you i was trying to well, get into college so i was trying to do what they wanted me to do too right and it might be non-objective or but the the native influence did not come until i was well into my 20s and I started doing the art shows, the actual art shows, started showing my work. I actually started painting on leather. I've always experimented with different mediums. So I stretched chamois cloth. Um, that's when the macrame things was big. So I was using those big macrame rings and, and, and lacing chamois cloths and making fringe and, and I painted Native American people. I mean, I just did. I don't know why I did. And I've noticed since then there's been, I know you haven't asked this, but <laughs> Um, I, I've painted some things that I don't know where they came from, and they just happened. So I meant to ask you too. Do you sew? So did you have that sewing background? From well, your mom? I could have because my mother was a good seamstress, and but because she was such a good seamstress, I didn't have to sew. <laughs> I, I did learn. But she had to. the love of materials. Uh, oh, the fabric, if you're going to get into the fabric, no, the fa I can tell you how the fabric thing came about. I was at the Trail of Tears show. I had just started showing there, and it was, it was in probably 1995, 96. The first painting that I did, I did an oil painting, and it was just uh, Indian blankets, Native American blankets, and, you, and they just went off the edge of the canvas. And I entered that. I think that was the first thing I entered. I don't think I, I want anything on that one. But then I got to thinking about when you're in bed and you're, and you're laying in bed as a little kid. I had two brothers, so we had, always had little cars. Well, you make the mountains and you drive the car up the mountain. So I thought, oh, I'll make blanket mountains. So then I started, I did my blanket mountain series, I called it. And I painted uh, mountains that looked like blankets. And, and then from there, I thought, I started seeing the calico cloth in some of the other paintings from other artists that, you know, they were painting the native in the calico. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll just use calico. And I thought about paint. I thought, oh, that'd be hard to paint all those little flowers. <laughs> There's got to be an easier way. <laughs> so I started experimenting with the cloth. And I actually, when I first started, I actually, it was three-dimensional. I, I wrinkled it up and tried to make the folds out of the cloth, but it didn't look right. Then I tried cutting it and putting it on top of each other and it still didn't look right. So finally, I got it down to where I, I, and I still do this. I use it, I have so many things that I do that I don't always do it all the time. I need to do some more pieces. But I piece it together like a puzzle. So each piece is, it, it's flat, it sits together flat and it's smooth that way. And then I can, I go on with the process from there. But that, it came from those, that blanket picture. It went to the blanket mountains and then I saw the calico and I was going to make calico mountains. And then since then I have made, you know, faces and animals and whatever I wanted to out of the calico material. But it, it was really good for me. And I haven't seen anyone do it except one guy. And I was at the Idle George show, and this was years later. And he was from the southwest, I can't remember, New Mexico, Arizona, somewhere. And I looked at his stuff, and, <laughs> and I thought, and he looked at me, and <laughs> we eyed each other suspiciously. But neither one of us knew each other, so that was. This must have been on parallel tracks. <laughs> <laughs> um, who were some of the native artists that you admired when you first started showing? Well, Troy Anderson, of course. <laughs> when I went to anyone that was at that Trail of Tears show, 
uh, Gary Montgomery, Troy Anderson, you know, these people were, they were winning all the time. And, and I sort of started at the same time Jeannie Rorix and Dorothy Sullivan. And, and uh, there was, um, I can't even think of some of their names now, but there was a group of us that, of women. We actually had a seven Cherokee women uh, legend show that traveled, I think, um, um, I just lost my Bert Seaburn's daughter. Um, Connie. Connie. I think Connie was in it, and uh, Mavis, the basket. Doreen. Doreen. So we had seven women in it, and we just did legends and travel. But I met all of those people from the Tahlequah show, so that's probably the ones that influenced me the most. Now, um, who put together the seven? Uh... It, it wasn't me. <laughs> it, was um, it hosted by a museum, do you remember? I remember... It, it was, uh, Salm Springs had the museum there, and we, I know we went to a show there. I don't think the, the gallery's there anymore, mm -hmm. it wasn't a museum. Oh, gallery. the Indian Paintbrush Gallery. Yeah, Indian yeah. Paintbrush Gallery. Yeah. It was one of the seven girl, or two or three of them that got together. That helped yes. produce the show, and then you all traveled with it. We a actually, bit. our work traveled. Just your work, okay. The work traveled, and then we, we did a few shows where we actually went. What with, were some of the places you went? Well, the Indian Paintbrush Gallery, for one. It's been quite a few years ago. I'm not sure I can remember all of them. Maybe we didn't go to that many places. You didn't go back east at all? No, it, no, no. It, was, yeah. it wasn't all in too Oklahoma. far, but it was a great idea. Yes. And, uh, I, it'd be a good idea to do again for some of you know the right. seven and, and the legends. Right. Um, sometimes the business side of art is the hardest to get a handle on. What did you learn about business, um, the business of art in those early years? And of course, I realize you're teaching during the week too. But in the early years, I didn't do that many shows. I I didn't have a display to even set things up. I would. Sometimes I would even ship things to uh, a competition. I'm very competitive, so I, I like the competitions. And I would take and leave. So the business part of it, you know, I wasn't in it to make the money because I, I did have a job and, and I taught school. Uh, since then, you know, I'm learning, I'm still learning about the business. And I don't think anybody really enjoys the business part as much as the creating part, so. Uh, how did you figure out how to price your work? I think I, th I think that that comes as you do it. Like I started out cheaper, and as you go, you see what something sells for. You see what other people are selling for. Um, I want people to have my art. I don't want to keep it all. I'm, I paint rather quickly. I can produce quite a bit, and. I don't think I'm overly priced. I think probably if under, I'm underpriced on some of my stuff. But like I said, I, I want it to get out there. And um, I, think it, I think as an artist, you price it as you get better, as you win more, you know how much work you have in it, what it means to you. So you price it there. Would I rather have that piece of art or this much money? Um, so while you were teaching, did you have family responsibilities as well, and how did you juggle that in the artwork? By teaching school, I had my summers off, and I, I had one son. And of course, as a school teacher, it's not—it doesn't end when the day's over. It continues on and on. And I, I managed to do it. Like I said, I can work rather quickly with art, so I had no problem producing the art, and and I loved it. And I didn't mind doing it. So th there wasn't a problem juggling the family, the art, and the job. When you were teaching, what kinds of things did you try to pass on to your students in terms of art? I think one of the things is the creativity part. You don't tell them what to do, you give them an idea, and, and encourage them to be creative. And, um, and, you know, just to let them know all the good stuff that can come from being an artist or doing art, even if nobody else likes it. If you like it, it makes you feel good. 
it's it's a it's a great thing for kids and and adults and you know people should do it and even if they're naughty you don't have to do it when you're six you know you can start now if you want to and I think everybody can be an artist in their own way and and do do what they are proud of what makes them feel good so I mean I of course I'd love to you know teach want to be better artists and and I had some really good students, you know, go through, and some of them went on to do art, and some of them still are not. Nice. Yesterday, I had a young man come by my booth. Well, he's not young anymore, he's 52. And he's still drawn, but he won't show his work anywhere. And I'm trying, still trying to encourage him to show his work, so. How did the teaching impact your own artwork, do you think? The teaching? Well, a time or two, I mean, I've done a few paintings that you could tell I was a school teacher there. Uh, I did one called, what is, so I get that time right, what will be left is what is taught. And, and um, I had a book open and there was a little native boy there and then I had faces in the background. And so, you know, in that way, a time or two I've done it. A painting or, some, or a piece of art that might look as if I was were a school teacher, but as far as it influenced my art personally, I'm not sure that the teaching influenced my own art. So, what was your first major award, and how did it impact you? I think the first major award, probably the the one that I remember, was at the Trail of Tears show, and the judge, the year it was about the second year that I entered was the editor of Southwest Art Magazine, Su Susan. Susan House then again. Yeah. And, and I did a picture, uh, I had a little elderly man holding a chicken. <laughs> and I called it The Brave and the Chicken. And I think she liked the title, but, but I won a merit, I think they had merit awards then. So I was, because it was her and, and it was that book, and I think probably that was the first one that really meant something to me, you know. Uh, what was one of your important galleries early on? You know, I've never really done a lot of galleries, but the best gallery that was in Sepulpa, and Shirley Wells, uh, Indian name of the gallery, Indian, Indian Territory, Indian Territory Gallery. gallery. Yeah. And, I, and I love Shirley, and Shirley and myself and Bert Sieberg all had the same birthday. <laughs> so that was kind of cool, but, but Shirley, I, I did get a piece that went to Paris because she took an exhibit to Paris one time and I had a piece, so that was a, a big deal for me to have a piece called Paris France. <laughs> but she actually sold some things for me and, and I really didn't um, go into too many galleries. I lived so far away, it was hard for me teaching school, hard for me to, you know, to go back and forth and change things out. And so, so I really haven't done a lot of galleries, still don't. Did you do any out of state shows, or probably not until you got into this. No, in the I, I 90s. did out of state shows. I in mailed to South Dakota, to, to Red Cloud. <laughs> I, I shipped things uh, for a competition. Uh, Lawrence, Kansas, I shipped up there just for the competition. And, but I didn't actually go and set up until I started doing it full time. Right. So maybe just in terms of the art show landscape rather than galleries, how did the Indian art scene change, do you think, from, and you're just dropping in on it, I understand, periodically during the 80s, but like from the 80s to the 90s? Well, I think that when 9-11 happened, that changed a lot. I. I would find myself going to a show for the first time and everyone would say, oh, this used to be a good show. <laughs> and I would seem to be getting in on the end of it when it was dying. And, but uh, before 9-11, uh, you know, I had some of the better shows I, I, I've ever had. And since then, it's, it's, something happened, I'm not sure. There's been some good shows since, but I, I think that was probably the biggest change I've seen in the landscape of the shows, within that event. 
1990, the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed that required uh, artists to provide proof of tribal enrollment or be certified by their tribe as artists who could represent that heritage. Do you remember the impact of that bill on galleries or individual artists or shows? Well, because I wasn't involved with galleries, I know that it's, it has uh, affected some individuals. I, when I when I was in McAllister and doing, I did one art show a year. It was an Italian festival, and that's when I was doing the leather work with the Native Americans on it. And, and someone, I don't even remember who, came to me and said, why don't you go to a Native, well, have you ever thought about doing a Native American show? I said, I didn't know they had Native American shows. I didn't know anything about them. And I, and they said, I said, I'm, I'm Native American, but I don't have, I don't have a card. And they said, well, you don't have, they'll, you know, they'll take you on your word. And I said, oh, oh, okay. So I started going to uh, the Five Tribes Museum and, and Tahlequah to the Trail of Tears show. Then when the law came, I, uh, you know, I, I saw, well, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to do something here, but right? I'm not going to be able to go. And so talking to family members, and I actually um, met a great aunt that was, uh, she was married to my great uncle, who I never met, but that was, um, her father-in-law was my native grandfather that, you know, anyway, her name, her name is Winnie Gibson, and she was about 80 at the time, and she's actually in Charles Banks Wilson in search of pure, pure bloods. She's one of his uh, subjects. She's full blood Choctaw, and she was married to Adam Gibson, who was my um, my great-grandmother's brother, but my great-grandmother was the first child and there were four wives and she was with the first wife and Adam was, Ad, there were actually twins, Adam and Eva, and, and they were the last two children from another wife. And my mother, when we moved to Kiowa in 1960, told me about Aunt Eva, but I was 10 years, uh, eight, eight years old, so I really didn't care about, me, you know. And I didn't even think at the time, you know, to ask questions or anything. So it wasn't until I was in the 20s that Aunt Eva had already passed away. But Winnie Gibson, the wife of Adam, was still alive. So I went to her house and visited with her, and she signed an affidavit that, my, that her father-in-law was Native American, who would have been my great-grandfather. And so with that information, that's all I had. I, I was a uh, state-recognized uh, Cherokee, uh, each other Cherokee. And that's what I have. And that's all I have right now, so. I understand after you retired for a couple of years, you still taught art a couple of times mm -hmm. a week. As you're transitioning from teaching into doing art full-time as a profession, did that sort of help to have that teaching a couple of times? I think I think the teaching a couple of times was purely for financial reasons. I had retired on my own. I wasn't sure, you know, financially, and so I thought, well, that'll give me three years to see how I'm going to do, just doing the art and and um, on teacher retirement school. And, and I, I love the job. I kept an elementary art program going for three years and did the yearbook. <laughs> so, but you know, it's great. I went on Tuesday, Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and and then I had a five-day weekend. So it was great. Uninterrupted art time there. Um, you've been going to the Cahokia Mounds show for several years, and you won the People's Choice Award there. I read two years in a row. What do you like about that show? The people. I, I love the people, and of course it was exciting to go and learn about the, the mounds, and, and the museum is a wonderful museum. Uh, it's a small, intimate show. Uh, the people are so nice. We've made a lot of uh, really good you know, friends through that show. It's a good place to get to know artists better. There's a, uh, at every show, there's a group of artists that go, and you get to know them every year. You step with someone different, you get to know them, you make friends. I think it's just the fact that of the people basically that I really like that show.
Is there a funny um, show story or travel story that stands out for you? Well, I love humor, <laughs> and uh, um, I'm not sure if there's a funny uh, show story that I could tell, <laughs> or, or, or a uh, travel story, but I can tell you about some of the humor. I love humor in paintings, and, and I've had several paintings that were humorous, but, and I would love to have a whole display of just humor. And, but I tell everybody I'm just not that funny. I can only do like a three and then I'm not funny anymore. <laughs> but uh, I, I, had a, I had one that I had a little baby raccoon and, and a can of Libby's corn. <laughs> so you know what the title was. <laughs> and the titles I think are really important to, I call it Cancun. And I spelled it C-A-N-C-U-N. Well, I had it at the same time I had Custer's Last Stand. Oh. And Custer's Last Stand, I had had a hard time finding these because it's politically incorrect, little plastic cowboys and Indians like you would buy. I still have them because I saved them. I may need them again. <laughs> but I painted one little plastic um, cowboy. I think he was green. Then I had these rows of Indians, red, yellow, and blue. And I had done, it was a huge painting, and I had some, it looked like tool leather, but I called it Custer's Last Stand. They were all aiming at him. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I've had several really uh, funny, I have one called, There's a Hair in My Soup. Yes, and, I saw um, I think I had one, it was uh, Old Wives' Tales. It was just three women bending over, <laughs> picking up logs. It was, I mean, just, and, but people love humor. And I've noticed a lot of humor in, in Native work, and that's a good thing. One of the three-dimensional effects that I enjoy in your painting is when you use uh, wild turkey feathers, and sometimes you put them on their on your women, and they're sort of function as a cape. Um, which, in fact, wild turkey capes are traditional capes. Yes. But how did you get the idea of using wild turkey feathers? I, I saw people paint on feathers, and I thought I can do that, so I did. <laughs> And then, because I didn't want to be just like them, I, I started cutting out the edge of the feathers. And then from there, I had all, people started giving me feathers. And so I had the beautiful little feathers, but they weren't big enough to paint on. And just looking at one one day, I saw the fringe on the end, and I, I thought, oh, that could be a shawl. I turned it upside down, used the scissors a little bit. And from there, you know, I, I started using all the little feathers I could find for their Capes. I haven't seen anyone else doing that yet, but mm -hmm. but uh, it, it works really well for us. So if you see a, one of my pictures and it has a cape, it's probably a feather. Yes, we're going to look at one here okay. a little bit. Uh, what's an object or material you've begun using lately that's relatively new for you? The leather. I, I've always wanted to do three-dimensional. I haven't had the equipment. I'm not in a, a good area as far as foundries and I've taken some clay classes, I've wanted to do three-dimensional, I've taken some wood carving classes, but that takes a little long. I've found leather, and I love the leather. In July, in fact, I've been doing it about six months now, and I have, it's been pretty successful. I've, I've won some awards with it already in 3D, I've never entered it in 3D before, and, but I'm also incorporating paint with the leather, so I'm using my painting and 3D, and you could probably in a month or two see some feathers in there, <laughs> or some cloth, <laughs> or I'll, I'll put it all together one day, I'll have everything right there in one piece. Although it can be expensive. But. Well, you know, when, I, when you think about it, I can get a lot of money in a frame, because I don't, I don't do any, I, don't, I may buy a frame and put something in it, but I don't make any frames, I don't do it. So I go to a frame shop, and I, may, I may have 300 bucks in a frame, you know, and uh, the leather is expensive, but um, yeah, I, when, I'm, when I think about, you know, taking it and having it framed and matted, it's probably not any more expensive than a painting. You recently illustrated a book, so we bought the farm. Oh. <laughs> I wondered what that process was like. Oh, it sounds I, like I a didn't cute, know you had that information. It's a cute title. <laughs> I found it on the internet. Oh, well, actually from Cahokia Mounds. One of the guys that, that uh, we just loved so much was always telling these funny stories, and he decided he was going to do an, his first ebook. 
So he asked me, would I just do some little sketches for it? Well, I said, sure. You know, I, I, loved, you know, I loved him, you know, so I thought, well, I'll help you out, you know. And so I just did them, and I, in fact, I gave them to him. So they I were pencil sketches? No, no, I did a little, it got into everything I do, you know, it sounds like a little sketch, but it gets into something else. No, so they wound up four full color little pictures, and I wound up doing maybe more than I thought I was going to have to. But, uh, and I was just doing it, just doing it as a favor to him. I mean, you know, he was, he could have paid me or whatever, but I was scared to him. But the editor that uh, did the book, he shared his percent with me. So I've actually gotten a little bit of money from that project, but it was, it was fun to do the book. And since I've learned that, hey, I keep it, I get a little check every now, I'm thinking, maybe I ought to do some more book illustrations. Your first royalties, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize that was out there. Um, you have the name Two Nations, is that right? Two for, Nations for Art. Your art. Two Nations Art for your business. Can you explain why you chose that name? There's a couple of reasons. Uh, well, actually three, I guess. I was looking for a name. <laughs> and the Two Nations, because, you know, in my uh, native blood, an eighth is all I could be. That means I'm seven eighths something else. And if you're seven eighths something else, you know, there's two nations involved there. Then the um, uh, my boyfriend, who's from Canada, he was going to be my businessman, he, and we still work together. And uh, and he does art. So there's two nations, Canada and the United States. It so it's it's both of those things. It was the Canadian United States, the Native American, and whatever else I am, which I'm not sure of. <laughs> You work in a variety of media, as we've mentioned, um, acrylics, watercolors, pencil, um, you sculpt. What, what is your favorite and why? I think my favorite is what I'm doing presently. Um, I tell everybody I'm like a kid on a playground. You know, I play with the feathers for a while and, and, it, and it sparks something else, another idea, and I'll go to the leather, or I'll go back to the fabric, or I'll go to the, just the regular painting, or, or drawing, are a combination of all these things. I think it's it's whatever I'm working on. That's my favorite thing to do. In terms of acrylic paintings, how has your um, palette changed over the years? My palette? Mm -hmm. You mean my color? I'm not sure I have a color. Do you so see your color? range of colors? I know that, I know that's, this has always confused me myself about my work, is that it doesn't look all the same. I don't think I have a palette. Some people you'll see, a, you can tell their work because they use a lot of the same colors. And maybe I do and I just don't notice it because I'm too close to it. So you'll have to tell me if I have a palette. I'm not sure I have a certain palette that I use. What role does story play in your work? Oh, I think it's very important. Uh, story plan, I, I'll do little paintings that I'll call my sellers. They may not always have a story. Uh, it's something, you know, you, can't, you just do, people like them, but the big pieces, the competition pieces, I think they all ought to have stories. And I think it's very important. And some of those stories, that's what I was saying, some things have come out that I didn't know was in me. Oh, things I didn't know about my own heritage. Can you and uh, give an one example? thing, I, I did a, a picture of um, um, a woman and I, in a corn. She was coming out of the corn, and there was, uh, I knew seven was a sacred number, and I had seven babies in the corn, almost like an Ann Geddes type thing, but they were, they were in there. And Dorothy Sullivan said, Oh, you did Selu. And I said, Who's Selu? Because I didn't know who Selu was. And, uh, and then I did a picture once. And this isn't my own heritage, but I did a, a coyote, and I had a man's face in the coyote. And then I find out that that is, a, a, I'm not even sure which plains tribe it is, but where the man change, the coyote can change it to a man. And, and it was, and I've done several pieces like that, that, you know, I've done, and then someone's told me the story. There was a story there. I just, I didn't even know it was there. And then, of course, I, I, I do stories. In fact, I'm working on the leather pieces. I'm trying to do some with legends, and I would love to 
have stories. I'd love to do just a Cherokee legend and have a whole display that's just legends. Whether it be painting or sculpture, I think it'd be a great teaching tool and a, and a great way to preserve, you know, what the Native culture that I think these shows are attempting. That's what they're, the purpose, one of them. Right. You've sort of talked about your titles, how some of them are plays <clears throat> on words and humorous. Um, do they always come easily? Is it sometimes a... Sometimes it does, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, and the names do change from time to time. <laughs> I'll think, what did I name that? And it'll get a different name. But uh, is it a, a lot of those names come driving down the road. <laughs> You're thinking, what am I going to name that? Like, okay, I just did a piece. I just finished a huge, the biggest sculpture piece I've done. It's over four feet tall. And I, I did it with the three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash. At the time, I knew corn, beans, and squash. I had forgotten it was called Three Sisters. So I was doing some research to see. I'd already had it, the corn, beans, and squash on it. So I called it, since it's a woman, I call it the Fourth Sister. But names sometimes come easily. I have had the title before the picture before. Do you keep track of them in the notebook, or? I, well, after a while, I, they're committed to memory. So I haven't kept track of my art as good as I should have. There's, there's pieces that have gotten away that I, I can't remember. How about your signature? How do you, uh, that's sometimes an art to place your signature on a painting. Right now, mine looks like a stamp, but, um, it, it has evolved in um, high school because I started doing artwork in high school. Sold a few little things in high school. I had A. Caldwell. And then when I got married and took the Jackson name, I went to A. Caldwell Jackson. And then from there, it's just evolved to Caldwell Jackson. And, and I have started, it just looks like, a, like I said, a stamp. And sometimes I'll write something in the middle of the stamp, but that's where it is. Today, on oh, um, that's on original work, and I considered on um, the sculpture. I thought, am I going to do the same signature as I do on the paintings? So, I'm not, I'm not sure. It's too new yet. How important is sketching for you as a preliminary process? You know, I do a mem uh, very little. Uh, my work. I have an idea in my head, and I will sketch some things, it depends on what it is, but for the majority of things, it develops as I go. If I have a sketch, I feel like I'm limited in myself, and if, I, if my mind sees something else and wants to go there, then I'll go there. I'm not going to let that sketch stop me from doing what I feel needs to be done. Now, you've mentioned that you're working quite a bit with leather in your sculpture. What other materials are you using? In the leather, it's, it's been a, because I've only been doing it since July, and in six months, um, I'm still experimenting with it myself, but, but I, I have figured some things out, and I want it to be solid, so, so I have found that I can fill them full of styrofoam. And the styrofoam will swell up and it, it'll, even though the leather is, is hard, and it would probably be okay, but I travel mm -hmm. with these things and pack, so the more solid it is, the better it is. So I have found that if I fill them full of styrofoam, it's lightweight, it's going to be durable. I mean, if it's true what they say about, you know, styrofoam and plastic cups in the landfills, is never, it's going to be there for thousands of years. I figure, well, that may be there for a thousand years too, so... <laughs> So that's my thinking on that. And then for the faces, are you using something like Sculpty or what? Are no, you no, the faces face? are leather. The faces are leather too, okay. Everything is leather. I, I, I've done a few clay pieces, and it was usually faces what I do. And then, so I can, I have to mold the leather, wet it and mold it. I have found that I can carve in uh, a hard styrofoam easily and get a shape and then I can mold leather over that. 
So, and then manipulate it with tools. But no, it's, it's not, there's no sculpty involved. It's, it's all leather and I, I, I'm still playing. So ask me in six months and we'll see yeah, what I'm doing with it. Really interesting technique. Describe your creative process from the time you get an idea. There's always ideas running around in my head. When I go to a show, um, I think you, you're, because all other distractions are gone, and if you're looking at your work, sitting and looking at your work, you, you, you're bound to get some ideas. And seeing other people's work too, but, but I sit and look at mine and, and I think of what I want to do next, or what I want to change. The creative process, you just can't make any, any rules. If you set limits, you know, you're going to stop yourself from, from uh, doing something. That's why I've always liked to experiment with the mediums. And that's how I come up with the calico material, you know, and, and, and whether someone's done that before or not, I hadn't seen it. And so that was creative for me, you know, that was my creative idea. Uh, the feathers, using them the other way, the, the leather. I did see one little piece of leather in God's house, and I thought it was a piece of driftwood. And I asked him, is that wood? He said, no, it's leather. And that's what's, that was in July, and that's what got me thinking about leather. So it does, it just, um, the creative process is continually going up here. So. <laughs> What is your creative routine? Like, do you try to work every day? Is it mainly in the morning or at night? Or? Um, presently, I'm living by myself, so I have a lot of time. And my best time is early in the morning because my mind is fresh and I can get up and I can start working on stuff and I can work, you know, as long as I want. Either that or, you know, late at night, you know, I can I can work all day. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But but early in the morning, I'm 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 the best. I think. Well, looking back on your career so far, what has been a pivotal moment when you might have gone down one road but you took another? Hmm. I'm not sure because I'm not. I don't know if I feel like. I've gone down too many, or maybe some personal things, <laughs> but not in art, you know, that uh, I can't think of in art-wise any roads that I haven't gone down that I didn't want to go down. Or if I even had a choice, I'm not. So I don't think I've gone down any wrong roads in art that I know of. What's been one of the high points of your career so far? The high points of my career, it's almost like that the painting you're working on <laughs> is the one you like the most. The thing you're going through is the one you like the most. Now, I still have some goals. Like there's been some shows I've been in I've never won Best of Show. And I haven't won a lot of Best of Shows, but I've won a lot of awards. And I, I did um, um, get the governor's... Uh, community Service Award this year. Oh, well, congratulations. And, and that in was... In the arts. In the arts. And that was because of the work in McAllister. Uh, we opened a gallery. Uh, and we... Myself... I designed a mural, 80 foot mural. And myself and another guy painted. For free. We worked from May until uh, August one year. This is... It's... Um, it's probably 12 foot tall, 80 foot long, and it's a um, uh, trompe outdoor, uh, it looks like an art show going on underneath the building. And then we had local artists come and, and paint the little pictures. And I think doing that mural, um, even though it wasn't Native American in, in nature, but, but it certainly has opened some doors. I've done some other murals since then. Uh, the community, I just appreciated it, you know, so much, and and you know, I've had a lot of people say how good they think it is for the community, and I've always wanted to give back something to the community. So that was probably one of the highlights. I'm not sure if it was doing the mural or getting the award, but the the award was nice, but but the mural, I think I think what the people, you know, appreciated it so much that that was good.
and opening the gallery in a because we had we have a nonprofit gallery now, and uh, it's not just my gallery. I'm one of eight that help run it, and um, it's still, a co-op. It's, well, it's a well. It's a it's a we pay rent. Uh, some people just rent spaces and they don't work, but uh, you know it's just keep it open. Having a, a gallery there in McAllister, a lot of new people. I think the teacher thing comes out me because I'm wanting these young people to come, and, and we have a wall where newcomers can hang for free and. It's just, we only charge 10% commission, so it's, it's there to promote the art and the artist in southeastern Oklahoma, because we don't have a lot of galleries down there. That's, that's wonderful. Well, what's been one of the low points in your career? Low points in my career? Hmm. I would, <laughs> maybe when I first started, <laughs> because I... Uh, and I tell this to students. In fact, I told it yesterday to some of the students that were showing their, or whenever that the students were here Friday morning, possibly when they were uh, walking by and looking at the art. And, and uh, I told them, I said, you know, I'm, I'm glad you entered because it, even if you don't win, if you don't win, if you don't enter, you've lost. You're a loser. And I remember my first show there at the Italian Festival, and this is when I was doing the things on the leather. I, uh, first year I entered, and I would probably have been 23, 24 years old, I won an honorable mention, and I sold a drawing for $75, and I was so disappointed that that's all I did, because I wanted to win, you know, a first, a second, I wanted to sell a lot of stuff. I was so disappointed. I entered that show seven more years. I didn't win anything. I didn't sell one thing for seven years. So that was probably my low point, <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I did zero that whole time. So y you kept going. Um, and that was the only show I did, so I really looked forward to that show, and then I was always disappointed every year. So that was maybe my lowest point. But you persevered. I did, and it paid off. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we take a look at uh, three of your artworks? I can't think of anything that I probably haven't already said. <laughs> Okay, so we're looking at one of the, your painting that you won first place on here at the art show in painting. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Okay, the name of it is Tom for Cobbler, and I, I I've done a lot. Of, I, I do a lot of uh, women. I, I probably paint more women than I do men, and I, I do a lot with the fact that they were, you know, they gathered the the berries and the nuts, and and they did a lot of the crops and. And, and the food making so and I incorporated you know try to incorporate some of the cloth even though I didn't use the actual cloth on this one yes and your folds that you have yes. always loved to represent and these are huckleberries is that what you uh, blackberries. blackberries yeah blackberries yeah and how about this sculpture okay this is one of the leather pieces it's uh, one of the smaller pieces it's also one of the pieces that is um, I describe it in legend. This is the race between the hummingbird and the crane. And if you'll notice, the uh, there's a beautiful woman on the front. And then as we turn it around, I don't know if the camera will pick it up. But there yes. is a crane painted here. You have the hummingbird here. This is just artistic design, but it does represent the story. Oh, there's a crane the inside. The yeah, crane's I inside. See that. Oh, what a neat. And uh, the leather is it's very lightweight. Um, and um, I think I have a, just a design on the top of it. This piece happens to be hollow inside. That's really, really going to be a neat path to continue exploring. That's really neat. And how about this piece, Anita? Okay, this is um, one that has uh, the feathers for the capes. Uh, they're turkey feathers, and it was done on a photograph that uh, I had printed on a watercolor paper. The photograph was trees, a uh, burned out forest, and there, were, and there was no snow, so I went back and I painted the snow, I painted the orange glow in the back and the orange sun in the back and, and the women. I, this is one uh, uh, I have I do different things to the photograph. It's, I call it one of my sellers, things that 
you know, I can sell because I can, I can do them a little quicker. But I've, I've painted it with campfires and maybe three women, two women, horses, uh, houses, just whatever I want to put in, into the photograph. And we can see your signature there too. That's my little yeah. stamp. Your little stamp, yeah. <laughs> oh, great. That's really neat. And the title on this, did you mention? I don't, I don't, I normally don't, these are my sellers and, and I don't always have a title for them. So this, I don't consider this a major piece and I really have a title, but you're welcome to name it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. <laughs>